Hello everyone. My talk tonight is going to be about an invention that has accompanied mankind for probably more than 25,000 years. Ceramic. And this is the long journey we will relive in this story. Ceramic or pottery may sound as old things, but they are as relevant today as they ever were. Not only in everyday objects like plates and cups or decorative objects, but building materials like tiles and bricks also are ceramic and you are using some right now because there is ceramic in the semiconductors of the device you are using to watch or listen. To better illustrate how artisanal ceramics are made, the ideal is to visit a workshop and that's just what I did for this video. So let's go. We are in Santiago, Chile, at the facility of Paz Vial, a decorator and ceramic creator. And she was kind enough to show me around. This is not a sponsorship or anything. What she makes is sold essentially in Chile, in stores or on order. But if you wish to see her website, I'll put it in the description. So, how to create and reproduce all these objects? It all begins with the first one, the original, which is sculpted and polished by hand with clay. And once it is ready, its shape, its print, is taken in plaster, a matrix made with plaster. It is like a negative version of the item. This matrix serves as the model for molds, casts, that will be used to make many more. Typically the molds can be opened and there is an opening to fill them with clay on top. The material used here needs to be liquid enough to completely fill in the mold. So it is mixed with water to give it the consistency of melted chocolate or milk cream. Then it takes a few hours for the raw material to dry enough. It doesn't really evaporate by the small opening on top. It is more that water is mainly absorbed by the plaster of the mold. When the mold is opened, the piece has taken shape. It is still very soft and needs to be left to dry for several days. Flat pieces like uh, plates or ashtrays can be molded at once in one piece. But for containers like a vase, it takes two pieces that are assembled while clay is still soft and wet. Now these plaster molds can be used a few dozen times only and they need to be remade regularly because they get damaged a little bit every time they serve, especially for pieces with more intricate detail. They absorb water each time and have to dry between uses. And because they are made of plaster, they dissolve a little bit. Before pieces are fully dry, the bits that need to be removed are and a few days later, when they are almost ready, they are polished to look impeccable before the next step, which is going to be painting. 
paint or the coating of the ceramic has to be applied evenly on the pieces. And this is obviously not regular paint. We'll talk later about the coatings of ceramic, why they are very useful, and also the art that appeared around it long ago. Once paint has been applied, the time for transformation has come, the miracle of firing. Items are placed in large ovens, they are called kilns. One can accommodate dozens of pieces here, depending on their size. These ones are electrical, and the temperature inside rises in excess of a thousand degrees Celsius for several hours. For comparison, a kitchen oven can heat up to about 300 degrees, maybe a bit more, but here this is three times more, and the temperatures reached in these kilns would make many metals melt. Lead, for example, melts at just 330 degrees, zinc at 420. This is seriously hot. The firing is essentially about transforming the pieces thanks to chemical reactions. They become stronger, waterproof thanks to their coating, and the layer of paint also turns shiny. The pieces are then ready with their new properties, including a remarkable stability. Organic matter like wood may decay, metals can rust, ceramics stay exactly the same. They are somewhat fragile, but otherwise they will still look as new in centuries. This process has been perfectioned over several millennia. There are variants to it. There are also different types of ceramics that we'll talk about. But these bases were laid long before metallurgy appeared. They spread or were invented in multiple places around the world. And this is exactly the long story we are going to explore tonight. So, make yourself comfortable. You may sit down or lie down. And as always, it is totally fine if you fall asleep during the talk. You can use the timestamps in the description or the first command pinned under the video to return where you left or go straight to a particular section. In the same command, there are links to Spotify and Apple Music, and I am also on other streaming platforms if listening there is more convenient for you. In particular, if you don't want ambient sounds at the end of stories, this is the place to go. They are posted there without sound. And there is also a link to my Patreon page if you wish to support the channel. This gives you access to downloads, occasional surveys. The stories are posted there as podcasts too. I have started to post them with and without background sounds all along because it was something that patrons requested. There are also previews and uh, importantly you help keep the YouTube channel free of ad breaks. But for now, all you need to do is relax, take a deep breath in and out and check your body. I'm pretty sure there is tension in your neck and your shoulders right now. Maybe you should release it gently and then pay attention to your arms and hands. You don't need to keep them under tension. 
Do the same with your legs, your feet, and off we go. How did it all begin? The oldest known ceramic artifacts are almost 30,000 years old, long before the first sedentary communities living on agriculture appeared. This corresponds to the late Paleolithic and it is contemporary to the painting, the ornamentation of a lot of prehistoric caves. It tells us that ceramic was used before there were permanent villages with craftsmen practicing metallurgy, for example, or more advanced forms of pottery with a wheel. The discovery that clay and other minerals could be fired and transformed to become harder and acquire new properties this is one of the first innovations of mankind. I'll tell you later about the various materials and the chemical reactions that happen during firing. But the first known items were not yet plates or jars. They were figurines made by hand and fired at several hundred degrees probably in basic ovens, basic kilns, dug into ground. The oldest examples of this were discovered in Central Europe, especially a statuette of a woman named the Venus of Viestonice. It was found in a prehistoric settlement in what is now the Czech Republic. Maybe there was a religious meaning associated with it, or it was a lucky charm, but prehistoric men from the region also produced hundreds of figurines representing animals of the Ice Age. Like I told you in the story about cave art, I'll put the link in the description, about ancient prehistoric paintings, the representation of animals, the appropriation of their image, was probably very meaningful, very important to these human communities. These figurines were probably not just toys or decorative objects. Now the oldest examples we have are from Central Europe, because well-preserved sites were found there, but it is likely that this discovery of early ceramic happened in multiple places around the world, or traveled easily, because 20 to 30,000 years ago fire had been domesticated and clay was abandoned around many human communities. Maybe prehistoric men just observed that earth or sand around and under their fires seemed to change appearance and texture after having been heated for a while. And they had the idea of trying this intentionally. We don't know exactly, but between these first figurines and the first examples of actual pottery, many generations passed at least 10,000 years, based on archaeological discoveries. But what is the difference between ceramic, pottery, terracotta, earthenware, or other terms like porcelain? It depends on the context. Technically, a pottery is an object, often a vessel, but it can be a decorative object too, formed with a ceramic material and fired at high temperature to make it harder and more durable. So in that sense, 
earthenware or porcelain are part of pottery. And they are also ceramic, which is a broader term that refers to uh, any mineral material that has been fired to modify its properties. So a brick or a tile, for example, is a ceramic, but it is not considered pottery because it is a building material and not an object that serves on its own. Now that would be a general definition of pottery, because when it comes to archaeology, pottery in this context only means vessels. And this is how we understand pottery as soon as it is about remains found on prehistoric or antique sites. In that same context, figurines are more often called terracottas, which literally means baked earth. It's the same material, same firing process. This is just a distinction based on destination that archaeologists make. And then another important distinction is between earthenware, stoneware or porcelain, which are different types of clay-based pottery. Porcelain is a type of ceramic that was invented in China long after the two others. We'll come back to this extensively later. And it had revolutionary properties at the time. Porcelain is like the most advanced and technical material when it comes to pottery vessels. It requires very specific clay material and a high firing temperature. Before it, there was earthenware and stoneware. Earthenware was probably the oldest type of pottery. It is fired below 1200 degrees Celsius, that's 2200 Fahrenheit. It is also sometimes called terracotta, and it is non-vitreous, meaning that it absorbs liquid such as water. It is still very present in our homes, except it generally doesn't absorb water because it is coated with a ceramic glaze. This is the process from the workshop I showed you at the beginning. The objects they made are waterproof, but not thanks to the ceramic material itself, it is thanks to the coating that is applied to it before firing. Then appear the stoneware, which is a broad category for pottery fired at higher temperatures and with a more specific formula. The main difference with earthenware is that due to the higher temperature and the different material, Stoneware is non-porous and it is often vitrified, that is to say turned into a sort of glass. This basically means that, contrary to earthenware, it does not soak up liquids. This was an interesting property that made stoneware successful for utilitarian wares and higher quality products. And here again, China was a precursor. The first stoneware artifacts appeared either in India, in the Indus Valley, or in China. But in China, and also in Japan, they became rather abandoned. Stoneware began to be produced in Europe much later, during the Middle Ages. And then came porcelain, another Chinese invention that the Europeans were eager to uh, imitate until they broke the code and found the formula in the 18th century. That was just a quick tangent about definitions. Now let's go back to history. So I told you that the first examples of pottery 
in the sense of vessels, appeared about 20,000 years ago, and the earliest fragments were found in China. It is believed that from China the use of pottery spread to Japan and the Russian Far East because shards of ceramic artifacts were found in these regions and they date from the following millennia. Did it then spread to the rest of the world or was it invented in multiple places? We don't exactly know, but during the Neolithic the making of pottery vessels was present on all continents. There are traces in Europe and in Africa, south of the Sahara, in the 10th millennium BC, and slightly later in America. Everywhere around the world, pottery became relatively common 10,000 years ago. It was cheap to produce, at least in comparison with precious artifacts, and it is probably the first type of wares that was made in larger facilities. We are not talking about industrialization yet, but as soon as the antiquity there were production centers that rationalized its production divided tasks and produced vessels not only for local consumption but for an entire region or sometimes for trade. This appeared in China, in India, in Mesopotamia and Egypt, in South America and it is quite unique because it seems the same didn't happen on such a scale for other products like textiles, for example. For thousands of years, objects were formed either manually or maybe using molds until the wheel was invented. It is believed the wheel was invented first in Mesopotamia and together with the first wheeled vehicles, the first potter's wheels appeared somewhere in Mesopotamia in the 5th millennium BC. And this helped to create curved pottery that was smoother, more regular, and probably much faster to produce, which made potters more productive. Another important element is that potteries were decorated. They quickly became supports for decorative or artistic expression. This brings a wealth of information about antique civilizations. Fragments of pottery can be dated using carbon dating, which helps a lot to know not only when they were made, but what period an entire layer or an archaeological site belongs to. Their decoration also tells us of the tools that were used, the styles, the techniques. They reveal a lot more than the fragments themselves. And pottery was also traded, so it tells us of the connections between cultures that could sometimes live thousands of miles apart. For example, an early people that spread across much of Europe is named after its use of pottery, the corded ware culture. They are called corded ware culture because they had a specific way of decorating their pottery. They wrapped it with rope while it was still wet so this left a decorative pattern. And then they fired their pottery, the rope burned off, and the patterns stayed on the ceramic. The corded ware culture spread across Europe about 5,000 years ago, in the late Neolithic, and it ended in the early Bronze Age, several centuries later. 
but the extent of its presence and uh, the period could entirely be mapped thanks to the dating and specific aspect of their pottery. The use of pottery vessels spread in the Neolithic and so did tiles and even more bricks. In regions that had few wood for construction, like Egypt, bricks were widely used for buildings. Stones was too expensive and slow to use for building, so it was reserved to tombs like pyramids or for temples, which are the Egyptian monuments that have crossed the centuries. But ancient Egypt was essentially built with bricks, often just dried in the sun, so in that sense they were not really ceramics, until they realized that bricks could become much harder and durable if fired in a kiln. So what is a kiln exactly? It is a term for a type of oven, a chamber that is thermally insulated. It can concentrate heat and can be used for the firing of ceramic because it reaches temperatures that are much higher than the one the basic oven for cooking could ever reach. The antique version at least at the start, was quite rudimentary. They basically just were holes dug in the ground. But across the centuries, kilns were perfected and they became more and more efficient, reaching peaks of temperature in ancient China and to a lesser extent in Greece and the Roman Empire. So, speaking of this, let's take a look at the art of pottery in various ancient civilizations. Starting with Egypt, because it's always good to speak about ancient Egypt. We know about how Egyptians made pottery mainly from depictions on the walls of tombs and temples. Along the many centuries of Egyptian history, more techniques to form vessel and other objects appeared, but they all remained in use until the end. At the start, objects from the first centuries were just hand-shaped, but the problem when they are hand-shaped is that they tend to have quite thick walls and you cannot really make large objects like that with wet clay because they can collapse on themselves because of the weight before firing. So over time, new approaches were invented. One that was used for large items such as tubs was to make flat and relatively thin rectangular pieces of wet clay and then weave them together before firing. This is recognizable on archaeological sites because when broken these items tend to form rectangular shirts. They broke up where they were the weakest. The potter's wheel was introduced in the 3rd millennium BC, either copied from Mesopotamia or reinvented locally. The first potter's wheels were slow. The potter would make them turn with one hand and form objects with the other hand. As I said before, it not only facilitated the making of symmetrical and almost perfectly curved objects, it was also much faster and pottery could be somewhat standardized thanks to them. So like in other cultures, it came with a kind of mass production. Egyptians also used molds, especially to make the bread pans 
in which small conical breads were baked. These molds were probably just a cone of wood shaped like these breads and they added clay around it before letting it dry and then fired pottery. Later, in the second millennium BC, during the New Kingdom, the last period of Egyptian unity and independence in the antiquity, before the country was invaded multiple times, so during the New Kingdom, faster potter wheels were introduced. They were no longer put in motion by hand, but by the potter's feet. This made the forming of vessels even more productive. So in Egypt, pottery was widespread and part of everyone's life, even poor people. They had cups, bowls and plates, and often figurines of animals and gods. Before clay was completely dry, a bit of decoration was added even on cheap pieces. It could be with a few incisions or stamps. Then it was left to dry for a good time. Like others, the Egyptians had discovered that APCs needed to lose almost all their water before firing. Because if they didn't, water did not just evaporate in the kiln. Some of it stayed trapped inside the walls of the items, so it boiled and it could even make the piece explode. So they always need to be already dry before firing. The Egyptians had figured out that they could change the aspect of their pottery during firing too. They realized that if they let a good supply of air enter the kiln, the resulting pottery would take a red to brown color. It is because there is iron in clay, so when oxygen is abandoned during firing, they tend to combine and form iron-3 oxide, also known as rust. Whereas when they rationed air and oxygen, pottery took a grey to black color, because with less oxygen available, iron 2 oxide formed instead. They didn't know how that worked chemically, but they used this process to vary their decoration and their colors. And they also discovered more and more oxides that were introduced for more colors, blue, yellow, white. There were fashions in the decorative patterns, not really fashions in the modern sense, because they typically lasted for several generations, not years like today. But most Egyptian pottery, especially luxury pieces, can be approximately dated by experts just by looking at the patterns heads of gods like the goddess Hathor, or Bess, a god that protected houses, lotus flowers, papyrus, grapes. Some of the pieces were found intact in tombs after thousands of years, and they are a testimony of the refinement that the Egyptians were capable of. They are exquisite, and required a sum of different materials and know-how that could only be accumulated after centuries of trial and error. We know that pottery in Egypt had turned to an industrial activity in the sense that there were large workshops and in various sites the remains of multiple kilns were found. This indicates that production went on constantly and most of it was to be sold. But the status and the economic importance of pottery is less known. There is another civilization in which pottery had a major importance economically, and it is ancient Greece. 
There is an international research project about ancient ceramic that lists all known items. It is called the Corpus Vasorum Antiquorum, the corpus of ancient vases. Yes, it's a thing. It contains records of over a hundred thousand Greek painted vases. And when you think that most of the pottery produced in Greece was probably lost, this gives an idea of the millions and millions of pieces of Greek pottery that were made. The Greeks produced everyday pottery for kitchen use, of course, but they also developed a production of fine pottery, of luxury goods, that they exported all around the Mediterranean Sea. Not all of it was produced in Greece. Greek colonies also participated, such as in the south of Italy. The Greeks invented or used shapes that we associate with their culture. For example, the amphora. It is a type of container with a pointed bottom, and they could fit tightly against each other which made them perfect for transport by boat. This reduced the risk of losing cargo, because once they were positioned inside the ship and tied together with a rope, they wouldn't move. They were used in vast numbers to transport not just liquid, like wine, dry products too. And most of them were ceramics, even though there are a few examples of amphoras made of metal. At the time, pottery was way cheaper and accessible than copper, bronze or later iron, of course. Another Greek container was the pitos, a larger storage container that was used for bulk storage. This one could stand on its own on its base. More than other cultures, they also made vessels with a specific purpose. For example, for mixing, there was the crater, a large vase made to mix water and wine. The practice of drinking pure wine was very uncommon in the antiquity. It was almost always diluted with water. The Greeks had different kinds of cups, depending on the liquid they would receive. The most common type of wine drinking cup is called the Kylix. The Kylix had a broad body, raised on a stem from a foot, and usually there were two handles on either side. An alternative was the Cantharos, which was narrower and higher, with vertical handles. They also had more types of vases for oils, for cosmetics and perfumes. They made vases designed to serve as grave markers. And these are just a few examples of the extraordinary variety of Greek pottery. But what Greek pottery is also famous for is the ambitious figurative painting on it. In the first centuries when Greek culture emerged, the decoration of pottery was dominated by geometric patterns and a lot of circular and wavy patterns too. There were a few figurative elements, probably inspired by Crete, where the Minoan civilization was flourishing at the time, but not that many. The practice to depict characters and scenes on pottery really took off and dominated from the 7th to the 3rd centuries BC. And the production of vases was dominated at the time by Athens. You know that ancient Greece was not a single state at least, not until it was unified later by Alexander the Great. It was a cultural area, 
with a collection of small states, and the city-state of Athens was one of the most important. Athens invented the so-called red figure technique, that is to say a black background, with characters painted in shades of yellow to red. Before, characters were typically painted in black on a red background, and in production centers, vases and other vessels became a support of choice for artistic expression in a sense similar to painting on a canvas in modern painting. And the Greeks also developed a white ground technique later, by the end of the 6th century BC. Black figures and red figures were obtained through the application and firing of thin layers of slips. Slips are mixtures of minerals diluted in water. These colors were not painted on vases after firing. They were part of the vase itself. The white ground technique was based on paint itself applied on white clay and it was a valuable innovation because it allowed for more colors on vases. It is this mix of technical innovation and artistic value that made the Greeks dominate this trade in the Mediterranean. Their clients also knew pottery, of course, and produced their own vessels. But they just couldn't do what the Greeks were able to do in terms of technical achievement and style. And production in Athens or other cities was a true industry, perhaps the first example of an industry for consumer goods, because the production of other goods, like textile or furniture, was much more decentralized, whereas pottery was mass-produced to meet strong demand for elaborate luxury goods or for transport of food and beverages all around the Mediterranean Sea. As the Egyptians and later the Greeks were developing their pottery, so were pre-Columbian cultures in America. And this was also remarkable. The earliest known ceramics from the Americas were found in Brazil in the north, near the city of Santarém on the Amazon River, and they have been dated to between 8,000 and 7,000 years ago. They were produced by a culture of fishermen and shellfish gatherers that is otherwise little known. Between 7,000 and 5,000 years ago, Ceramics appeared all across North, Central and South America. It is unclear whether the migrations that came from Asia brought ceramic, or if it was reinvented locally in the Americas. Maybe both happened. But in any case, pottery was present several thousand years ago, from the Arctic region to the south of the continent. These cultures were often in contact with each other, but their geographical knowledge was limited to their region and its surroundings. So many different traditions formed, and potteries could look very different. In North America, the Mississippian culture that existed in the American Midwest and Southeast in the 2nd and 1st millennium BC used to temper clay with ground shell. Tempering is the practice of mixing clay with other materials. It could be ash, charcoal, sand, bone, or in that case, shell. The reason for tempering clay is that it avoids shrinkage or cracking during drying and firing of vessels. Pretty much every culture discovered this, and they developed their particular formulas. There were 
several other major ceramic traditions in what became the United States. The ancestral Puebloans from the southwest is another one, and the shapes and decorative patterns are all very different. But if we consider the Americas as a whole, an element that comes back more often than in other parts of the world, is the production of sculpture to make ceramic objects, especially human heads or faces. They all produced vessels and all the containers they needed, but there was also a rich tradition of creating figurines, sometimes quite large, and decorating objects like urns, music instruments, and even household pottery with sculpture. Ceramic was a form of artistic expression that still exists today, of course, but it has lost the kind of preeminence it used to have in these cultures. When we think about fine art today, we are probably more inclined to think about painting or sculpture. This is a reminder that the forms of art and expression are not set in stone, it is well possible that in a few centuries people will be surprised that Western artists of the 16th to the 21st centuries were so obsessed with painting on canvases. Let's go on because we still have more regions of the world to visit. And before we talk about China, let's make another stop in the medieval Islamic world because it also developed an aesthetic that mixed influences from the Mediterranean world and Asia. And more than any other cultural area, they used ceramic to decorate buildings with tiles. When the expansion of Islam began in the 7th century, they inherited various ancient pottery industries in Mesopotamia in Persia, in Egypt, in North Africa, and with them, centuries-old techniques and styles. This knowledge circulated within the Islamic world for several centuries, and it was also in contact with China, which was very influential because it was not just the most advanced part of the world when it came to ceramics, we'll get to this in a minute, the Chinese had also created a variety of styles, of shapes and colors that were very appealing to foreigners. Starting with all these influences and the circulation of techniques, Islamic potters soon developed their own innovations. In the 9th century, they started producing stoneware. You remember the difference between earthenware and stoneware? It is that earthenware is porous, it is fired at lower temperatures, and it needs to be coated to become waterproof, whereas stoneware is vitreous and non-porous, but harder to make because it requires mixing ingredients precisely, and also higher firing temperatures. In Persia, luster wares developed. These are a type of pottery with a metallic glaze that makes them iridescent. Another thing that the Islamic world would prove very good at developing was tin glazed pottery, also known as faience, which is earthenware covered in lead glaze with added tin oxide. This gives it a white and shiny appearance Faience was a huge success in Europe. It was imitated in Spain, in Italy, in France and in Northern Europe. It is still produced. Historically, faience industries developed in several European cities. An important one was Delft in the Netherlands, which developed a distinctive white and blue style. Until the 18th century, this was the best Europeans could do. They knew of Chinese porcelain, because pieces arrived, brought by traders or 
as diplomatic gifts, and they couldn't help but notice that Fayence looked like the poor man's porcelain, because it is typically much thicker. It has to be. Earthenware needs a minimal thickness to stay in one piece, and there is coating on both sides. So in comparison with porcelain vessel, it looks more rustic. And it can be very white and shiny, but it doesn't have the translucent property of porcelain. I'll tell you more about that when we speak about China. Returning to the Muslim world, another tradition in Islamic art and architecture that is still very visible today in Muslim countries, and that started in the 9th century, was to decorate the inside and outside of buildings with brightly colored tiling, generally arranged in geometric patterns. This was probably inspired by Byzantine mosaic at the start. The first examples were made like mosaics with many small tiles of one color, that were cut and arranged to create patterns. But later, with the better knowledge of firing and oxides to obtain colors, they started to make entire panels that were painted before firing, which is a much faster way of covering surfaces. The very intricate patterns on the domes and the walls, typically geometric patterns, or text, or flowers, or foliage, they are painted before firing, and once they are turned into ceramic, they provide at the same time ornamentation and protection, because they are waterproof and very durable. Our tour would not be complete without a stop in China, because since ceramic appeared, China has been the place where most innovations have taken place. And its tradition is so rich and ancient that entire encyclopedias could be written about it. I told you at the beginning that the very first known potteries appeared in China almost 20,000 years ago, during the Paleolithic era. The Chinese invented stoneware centuries before anyone else, as far as we know, and they found out how to make porcelain almost 2,000 years before Europeans, who were the first able to make real porcelain outside China. The Chinese also used ceramic as building material for thousands of years, bricks and tiles. And when it comes to production and trade, they dominated the world market as soon as trade connections were established in the antiquity. They produced on an industrial scale that served everyone, from the popular Chinese market for kitchenware to a more discriminating Chinese market all along the centuries, wealthier people had a knowledge and interest in ceramic in China. It was a sought-after luxury or upscale type of good. It was collected and used as decoration centuries before the same trend began in Europe. And up to the court of emperors who had access to the finest porcelain. So what made China so advanced in this field? Probably a combination of interest in ceramics that made the Chinese invest a lot in experimenting techniques. The internal competition between artisans and dynasties. And the interest of emperors and the taste of the elite for luxury goods. The same could probably be said of silk, for example. And thanks to all this, there were a few technological breakthroughs. The Chinese made kilns that could reach higher temperatures thanks to better insulation and ventilation. Making stoneware and porcelain requires temperatures above 1200 degrees Celsius, and these were reached in China in the first millennium BC, 
long before other parts of the world, as far as we know. And more than in other cultures, they worked on mixing clays with all sorts of ingredients. This is probably how porcelain was invented, as one of many experiments. The one key ingredient in it is kaolin, which is a clay mineral that comprises aluminium and silicon. This is quite specific, and there can be other ingredients necessary, like quartz. Then it has to be fired at high temperature, and porcelain gets its properties, the hardness, the transludence, from a process of vitrification. Porcelain is not glass, though, even though technically glass could be considered a kind of ceramic. It is a raw material, in the case of glass, a mix of sand, soda and potash, transformed chemically by firing. But glass is generally not considered to be a type of ceramic, because the ingredients are very different and the production process is also very different. Typically ceramics are formed and then they are fired. Glass is heated first to obtain a hot paste and only after that objects are formed with the paste. Glass can also be melted again and transformed. It won't return to its original ingredients but it can be recycled and made liquid again. Not ceramics. They can only be broken. Technically, it would not be impossible to liquefy ceramics at extra high temperatures and do something else with the paste obtained. But this is too complicated and not worth it. So contrary to glass, it is not recycled at all into new objects. The exact date when the fabrication process of porcelain was invented is unclear, because there were intermediate stages in the elaboration of the formula. The first proto-porcelain that was vitrified, hard and white, appeared during the Han dynasty, in the first three centuries of our era. I'll put a link to the story about the Great Wall and the history of ancient China in the description if you want to know more about the context. And by the 7th century AD, the formula had been perfected and stabilized with production on an industrial scale. Porcelain was a huge success early on and demand was very strong. To give you an idea of the scale of this production, the Chinese had developed long kilns that could be up to 60 meters long. They are called dragon kilns, and the kilns had a, a fairly steep slope, hence the name probably, that let hot air circulate inside. Up to 25,000 pieces could be fired at once inside one of these. The industry spread to Japan, but the Chinese protected their fabrication secrets because they got considerable income and prestige from them. Chinese porcelain began to flow into Europe in the 16th century, brought by Portuguese and then Dutch traders, and a technological race began between faience makers to try to imitate it especially the white and blue design that remains associated with Chinese porcelain, because at the time, under the Ming dynasty, it was popular there in China. In the process, various processes were invented that are not the real thing, but still represented innovations, and they are still produced today, like bone china, which was invented in England, trying to replicate the Chinese formula. It contains bone ash, which is what you get when you calcinate animal bones, as the name says. 
it contains calcium oxide and phosphorus, and it looked better than the thick faience that was produced at the time, but it uh, didn't have the transparency and the hardness of real porcelain. Another example was soft paste porcelain. It is called soft paste because it lacks hardness, so it could be scratched rather easily. And there were many formulas for it, but they didn't come close to the Chinese one because there was no kaolin. Finally, at the beginning of the 18th century, the code was cracked in Meissen, Germany, and later in other European countries, and an European porcelain industry took off along the 18th century with success. But still, the Chinese maintained a huge production and remained the mecca of porcelain, especially the city of Zhengdezhen. This is where the porcelain industry was concentrated at the time of the Ming dynasty. Ceramic in palaces and homes for decorative purpose probably reached its peak in the 18th and 19th centuries, but it is still very present in everyday life. I'm sure if you start paying attention to it in your home, you will be surprised at how many items you own in your cupboards, plates, mugs, bowls, cups, and possibly all around the house, lamps, vases, and other decorative objects. It is a different story, but in the 20th century, industrial ceramics started to be used for their properties like hardness, stability, or resistance to high temperatures. So they can be found in all sorts of devices and facilities, from semiconductors to cooktops to nuclear plants. But we have reached the end of tonight's story. There would be much more to say about ceramic, but you know where to find documentaries or books. And you can also pay a visit and support local artisans who keep this tradition alive. The sum of technique, know-how and talent that can be behind simple objects that we see every day can be impressive. And by paying attention to this, you train yourself to go beyond appearances and realize how rich and interesting our environment can be. It is easy to see things without looking at them, looking into them, and in the process ignore all the depth and substance they enclose. So, it can be ceramic and many other things, but start paying attention and uh, ask yourself questions about these little things around you. But for now, you can let go and fall asleep, or pick another story from my library, if you like, and I'll be back soon with a brand new story. Sleep well, sweet dreams, au revoir.